hi, you guys. Thank you so much for making the time for this amazing panel today. Truly, there's nothing more important than our health. For those of you that don't know, right now, seven out of 10 kids in the US don't qualify to serve in our military because of things like obesity, diabetes, food allergies, and a bunch of these conditions. It really is becoming a national security issue. And we've got to step back and say, what have we done wrong? And what do we need to do right? And as we were thinking about panels that we could bring to this event, we felt that it was really important to highlight and showcase the success stories of people that have done it right. What's fascinating about our panel today is that we have got people that cover 100 years of expertise and wisdom. Some of these companies were founded almost 100 years ago. Some of them were founded three or four years ago. The collective wisdom on the stage today is extraordinary. And I really want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to be here to educate and to teach. Because what we need right now is amazing, authentic, very strong leadership. The industry is following. People are paying attention. The multinationals are listening. Everybody's paying attention. And the people that are here today have taken the time not only to dedicate their lives to this work, to share their families with this work, you know, behind every single one of them are families and people that love them, that are generously giving us these amazing souls to be here today. And I think all of that has to be honored and recognized, and we're gonna tap into that wisdom so that we can continue to grow this movement, we can continue to foster this incredible entrepreneurship that's needed in this space. So today, I want to take a few minutes to introduce our panelists. Um, on the end here, we have Hayden Slater. He is the founder of Press Juicery. Next to him, we have Greg Renfrew, who is a dear friend. We've served on boards together. She is the visionary and founder of Beauty Counter. And then next to her, we have Kathy, Kell Kathy Kellogg Johnson and Kellogg Farm Products. They have been around, thank goodness, for hundreds of years. The wisdom that her family holds is extraordinary and I love watching it turn from one generation to the next, and I think that's only going to continue to succeed. And then next to her, we have Kelly Blahakis Hanks. And Kelly is another pioneer in the industry. The company's been around for almost 50 years. So there is an amazing amount of collective wisdom here from recently and from generations past. So I want to welcome all of our panelists. Thank you so much. So Kelly, I want to start with you because um, what m many people may not realize is that Earth-Friendly Products are in 62 countries, something like 25,000 stores, and you were just telling me right before we started that you were you know, back down in Bentonville, Arkansas, working with Walmart, and I love that because we've got to turn this Titanic. The health of our country is in pretty bad shape. We're dealing with a lot of conditions. Cancer, for example, it's one in two men and one in three women that are expected to get cancer in their lifetime. Cancer, unfortunately now, is a leading cause of death by disease in American children. That should stop us in our tracks. That is the future of our country, and we are quickly learning that a lot of the toxic ingredients that we have been putting into our everyday products, our shampoos, our makeups, our laundry detergent, are causing serious harm. And so I want you to just take a moment and speak to your story a little bit. It's important, I think, to remember that Kelly has stepped into her family's business. And that's not something that somebody does just blindly. It was a conscious choice as she chose to step into this family business and really expand it and lead it and grow it. And so I really want you to talk about what that looks like as you now you know, have secured shelf space in places like Walmart and Target and Costco. I mean, you're competing against these giant multinationals and how you've been able to make that transition. Thank you. Well, thank you, Robin. It's, it's really wonderful to be here with you all and to discuss our story. And I really am proud of the fact that we have not only placement in the natural retailers, but in the conventional stores as well. You know, one of the things that's so important to our company is that green products should be affordable for everyone. And so we've done that by being a primary manufacturer. We make everything ourselves. And we do it in our four geographic 
geographically diverse manufacturing facilities. And I think that is one of the critical things that allows us to compete with a lot of the conventional brands because you can find our products oftentimes at opening price point because we don't have to pay a third party contract manufacturer to produce them. Uh, we can also protect the integrity of our products because we can trace everything to the source. You and I were talking about the fact that, you know, I fly and meet with the farmers who grow our lavender. So we have complete supply chain transparency. But what she talked about is absolutely true that cancer and asthma and nerve and organ damage and so many very serious illnesses are definitively linked to toxic ingredients that are in traditional cleaning products. And it's important that when consumers are shopping that they're really reading labels and that they're looking what's in the products. Unfortunately, as we sit here today in the United States, there's no requirement around disclosing ingredients in cleaning products. So in food products and personal care products, you have the opportunity to see what's inside. And in cleaning products, you don't. So you really want to always select brands that are choosing to disclose what's in them. Because skin's the largest organ on your body. Your laundry detergent is absorbed through your skin because of the residue. Your plates and glasses that you're eating off of, that you're drinking out of, right? That residue is leaching into the food and into the water you drink. And so we have to be very careful about the choices that we make. But we've been doing it for 50 years. Actually, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And it's really an exciting time for us because as some of you may know, my father started our company in 1967. And certainly green products at that time uh, were not being clamored for by the masses. And so, you know, but he was so committed and so passionate and he saw what was happening uh, in the space. I mean, you can think of at that time, Rachel Carson, right? In 1962, writing about Silent Spring, there's more and more information becoming available and he really responded to that. And when I joined him in this venture in 2003, we were still a relatively small company. I mean, you know, we went a little building and we were in some of the smaller markets, but we hadn't achieved kind of the success as we have today. But we now have a consumer who's hungry for information, a forensic consumer who's online looking for information. She wants to protect her family. She wants to protect her pets. She wants to do the right thing for the environment. And it's about having information available for that consumer so she can make an informed and, educa and educated decision on those things. I think they have some images behind me showing, but you know, you can see uh, this is a shot in one of our labs. So all of our facilities, we have our uh, talented green chemists working and dedicated to creating the greenest products and really selecting thoughtfully sourced ingredients. And as consumers, I would really encourage you you know, to look for certain certifications, right? Since there's no requirement, look for products that are certified as safer choice. The United States Environmental Protection Agency has a wonderful safer choice program that not only looks for the greenest ingredients, but it looks for efficacy. And that's another way that we're able to compete for shelf space by having green products that work. You know, one of the things that I want to circle back to, I want to make sure we get through everybody first, but... Um, as a mother of four, and I know Greg's there with three of her own, you know, as a mother, you're constantly wondering, what's the impact of my work going to be on my kids as they grow up? And, you know, we can beat ourselves up on it, but we can also educate them. You are such an awesome, inspiring example of somebody whose parents inspired that in you into this next generation. And I think that is so valuable as a parent to see that in action. And I wonder when you were little, like, were you like, there's no way I'm doing this? Or, you know, were you like, my parents are so weird, I'm so proud of them, you know? So I wanna circle back after we get through everybody, but think about that for your next question. Yes. And then Kathy, you know, I would love for you again, you know, here your family almost 100 years has been focused on soil health. And this year, for those of you that don't know, there is a massive industry trade show called Expo West, it's in Anaheim. Almost 80,000 people come together this year for some reason, after you know decades and decades and decades of this stuff, everybody's talking about the soil. And here we have on the panel today somebody whose family has been devoted and dedicated to soil health for almost 100 years. And I think what very few people realize is that the soil that we have today 
no longer contains the nutrients, the vitamins and the minerals that it did when our grandparents were around. And so as soil health deteriorates, so does the quality of the product that you can grow out of that soil, and then so does the quality of our health. Yesterday I was with Patagonia, and Yvonne said, you know, our health is simply a symptom of sick soil. And so, you know, his focus is how do you restore the health of the soil. So today we have this incredible expert with Kathy. And I really would love for you to talk about what was this kind of aha moment growing up in this family that had this enormous wisdom where you realized I have to step into that. Because again, that was a choice you made somewhere in your 20s. When was it? I have some, I have some stories I could tell you. Um, and so one of the aha, in fact, after 92 years, we're 92 years old, we were founded, my grandfather founded Kellogg Garden Products in 1925. And um, so I have so many aha moments, but one that sticks out, as you asked, um, when I was 10 years old and gardening with my father, we were planting fruit trees in the front of our house. And uh, of course, using grow mulch, our standard, actually developed for Walt Disney in 1955 that um, we we're using that product and I said, Dad, why are you emptying out the dirt? Why are you putting dirt on dirt? It doesn't make any sense. That looks like dirt and you're pouring more dirt on it. I don't get it. And he said to me, he started explaining that you can always enrich your soil with more compost, but he said, it ought to be a crime to landfill anything organic. Our soil is starving. So it ought to be a crime to landfill anything organic. Our soils are starving for organic matter. So, you know, that went by. I thought, right, you have this teeny little fertilizer company in Southern California, no big deal. 20 years old, I was in Spain, and uh, my parents had never gone to Europe. Um, and my father wanted me to set an appointment at the Ayuntamiento de Madrid, which is this, uh, this sanitation district, basically. And so I went and set an appointment and said, um, so he could have a tax deduction and fly, right? And I, um, I, went to this ayuntamiento, quiero hacer una cita por el señor Kellogg, and the engineer just freaked out and ran away. And I thought, did I say something wrong? I mean, what did, did it, I, am I not speaking Spanish correctly? And she, nope, you're, you're fine. But he slams an engineering book on the table in Madrid, Spain, and turns to the page 150 and says, señor Kellogg, Carson, California. I go, sí, yes, señor Kellogg. <laughs> yes, it, I thought, oh, they think I'm the you know, the cereal company. No, no, you got the, the, the composting company. And it turned out that I learned and at about 20, we were the largest composting facility in the world, thermophilic window composting. And that this um, composting was not very common. So then my third aha moment, I don't know what you guys do for fun on a Friday night, but I actually look at our products through a microscope, <laughs> thinking this is kind of cool. <laughs> This is really cool, and it was a total aha. I mean, literally, I could show you on my phone if you want to talk afterwards, but I looked, and the, it's moving. It's moving. These tiny little things are moving. Those are bacteria. There's protozoa. There's rod-shaped bacteria. There's, there's beneficial nematodes. They're eating each other, and when they are eating the little tiny specks that are bacteria, then they're exuding more nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium. Their little fertilizer bags bacteria are. And the life we're adding to the soil is essential. We've spent multi-decades killing our soil, a war against the soil. And we can restore it by, guess what? Recovering anything organic. It ought to be a crime to landfill organics. Our soils are starving for them. So I have plenty more ahas, I'll tell you with my little uh, show and tell. You what know, you I am so grateful for your family and for you choosing to step into this because we're having this massive awakening right now and sadly it's being driven by things like food allergies and cancer and the skyrocketing rates of autism and all of us are suddenly like reading these labels like you talked about Kelly and we're realizing what we don't know what we need to know and then also what we need to do to be part of this change, and that it requires a very active engagement, that this isn't gonna work without us. And again, I think the leadership that is here today is being watched by these multinationals like General Mills and Kellogg's and all of these companies that are trying to figure out how do we do better, and they're so afraid. 
you know, they're so afraid that if they change, someone's going to say, well, what about what you did back here? And I think what you have to remember is that hypocrisy, they'll say it's so hypocritical, it's so hypocritical, you know, they did this and now they're doing this, but all change involves that hypocrisy where you pivot from one thing to the next. And so how do we lead that? How do we give permission for these multinationals to dump the junk, to get the stuff out of their product and teach? And I think, Hayden, what you've done with Press Juicery is a great example of that. You know, you established that company in 2010, and we were speaking earlier. I mean, I'm from Boulder. You're out here in California. People love to dismiss it or marginalize it or say it's just this kind of West left thing. And you quickly prove that this was not just some fad or trend, that what was being displaced were these liquid candy bars like Coca-Cola and Sprite and Pepsi and everybody else. And as you moved with that knowledge and that passion, I would love it if you would speak to how you were able to find the best ingredients, source the best ingredients, picking up on what Kathy talked about with the soil nutrition and that nutrient density product, and then how you've been really innovative with the chalkboard and the other parts of your business to really communicate the value of it to your consumer. Yeah, sure. Well, first off, thanks for having me. It's really exciting to be here. Um, and Kathy, thank you for all your work. We love recovered soil at Prest. Um, you know, Prest was really started as a passion project. It was, um, I'm, I'm born and raised here in LA, and I was somewhat educated in nutrition, uh, but never really practiced it. So I was kind of like a fast food junkie growing up, and, you know, constantly living in this fog, uh, not really knowing why. And it wasn't until uh, I went to NYU for, for film and theater, and I had this required yoga class. Um, and no college kid wants an 8 a.m. yoga class. Um, but in walks this like beautiful blonde teacher, and she just had this vibrant energy, and she carried this this thermos of green green juice, um, and she kind of just opened my eyes over the course of a year to to this whole world of words that I've heard of like juicing and macrobiotic food and you know chanting and yoga, but I'd never really practiced any of it. Um, long story short, her name's Chris Carr. She uh, created Crazy Sexy Cancer. Uh, she's a cancer survivor, and she not only, to me, uh, defines the term survivor, uh, but, but studying under her for a year and seeing the power of a bottle of juice really just resonated with me. Um, so I, I finished school. I, I, I finished uh, NYU. I came back. I was at HBO. I never went abroad, which was like a regret of mine. And so when I wrapped my show, I, I bought a one-way ticket to Southeast Asia. And I heard Chris's voice in my head going, do a five-day cleanse. So I attempted this five-day cleanse, and I felt so great, I ended up doing 30 days. And although a bit excessive, um, it was the end of that where I had this aha. You know, this is what you're supposed to feel like. This is my energy, my, clar my clarity, the fogginess. Um, and, and juice kind of, for me, was this catalyst of, it was that first step. It was, you know, if I start my day with a greens juice, uh, I want to work out today. I want to eat cleaner today. And I kind of took this, this journey and I said, I want to pursue this professionally. Um, and I partnered with two of my childhood friends who kind of shared the same passion. One had a young kid and, and loved this idea of masking nutrients in juice. And my other partner who I grew up with unfortunately lost her mom to cancer. And, you know, we've never made claims that we're going to cure or fix or heal, but I think we've always taken this approach, you can't argue that four or five pounds of produce is doing anything bad for you. And that, that's what we really wanted to focus. And being a, a, a native of LA, this, this whole sector was always intimidating. You know, it was you have to do this or you have to do that. And we wanted to prove that you don't. Everyone's got different goals. Everyone has a different purpose or different reasons for wanting to get to wherever it is they want to get to. And we wanted to take this approach of let's celebrate, let's make it fun, and let's make it for everyone. Um, and so that's kind of like how Prest started. And you know, I said when we, I always say when we started Prest, we were a juice company, um, but we've evolved so much because you know we we, we launched Prest uh, as you mentioned in 2010 in a 22 square foot broom closet. So we were over in Brentwood. I took the door off. I put a Dutch door in. Uh, I, I got a cupcake shop in Beverly Hills to give me their kitchen at night. And I would make juice from about 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., load up my car, bring it to our kiosk, 
Um, my partner Carly would work the first shift, and that's kind of how it was born. And um, we used to say, you know, we're juice and we're cleanse, and over the years we've kind of evolved into, you know, we're not just a juice company and we're not a cleanse company. You know, those are two uh, products that we offer, but we're really a lifestyle brand. And we're really, and you know, you mentioned the chalkboard. The chalkboard was, was born uh, out of this, um, everyone's got something to teach, everyone's got something to learn. We don't know everything. No one really knows everything. Let's create a platform for just that. And let's create a space where everyone can have a voice. And again, we can always make it playful. We can always make it where people, you know, I always say we kind of focus towards millennials a little bit, but with this, anyone can walk into our space and feel welcome. And I think, um, you know, I, I, we're, we're a retailer at our core. And so I, I obsess over retail. But if you look at what's happening in retail, you look at, you know, the, the, the dry bars and the soul cycles and the sweet greens and, you know, pressed juicery, none of us are revolutionary concepts. It's juice and a hairdryer and a bike and juice. You know, as much as I'd like to say I invented juice, we didn't. It's been around for a long time. But we've really recreated the experience. We've created an environment that people want to be a part of because it's not this daunting, intimidating space that it once was. It's exciting and it's fun and, and you want to say you're a part of it. You want to hold the bottle. You want to rock the shirt. And, and you know, so we feel, uh, you know, you, I think it was you when you introed us saying how much change is happening. It's, um, it's incredible to watch this movement happening throughout not just the country but the world of people becoming more conscious of what they're consuming, what they're eating, what they're drinking, what they're using for, you know, uh, their beauty products, their, their cleaning products. And to be a part of this movement and to have a voice at the table is, is super rewarding and really exciting for us. I do. I think the knowledge is such a gift that we've all been really lucky to receive early. And when you acknowledge that you have received this gift, you feel that responsibility Absolutely. to continue to share it and to give it. And I think any time you give a gift, you're usually giving it with this sense of love and excitement and joy. And I think it's that energy that makes this so contagious as a, as a space and as an industry. One of the things that you touched on, which is so important, is to not make the perfect the enemy of the good. And I think, you know, what you've done with Press Juicery is you've made it accessible. You know, it wasn't that somebody had to go out and buy the juicer themselves. It was something that could be chosen routinely as much as they want to and integrated into part of somebody's, somebody's weekly plan. And I think that accessibility component is critical. And what I love as we transition to Greg is that she revolutionized that model. And she and I had worked together on the board of Healthy Child, Healthy World, and we were seeing some of the data and some of the statistics of what was happening to the kids. It is enough to shut your heart down when you really look at what's happening to the health of the American children. They've been called Generation RX because of the rates of allergies and autism and diabetes and all of these things. And it was truly awe-inspiring to watch you step into that model and step into that vision and create what you have created with Beauty Counter for so many reasons, because again, you were, here we all were talking about food and you know some of these other products. You were taking on a category that nobody had touched yet. And that takes a lot of strength, it takes a lot of tenacity, and it takes a lot of intellect and courage. And as you built out this model of Beauty Counter, it was this network marketing concept. It was how can we collapse that middleman model which takes cuts and cuts from broker fees to distributor fees to all these things that again, jacks up the price of some of these products, keeping it out of the hands of people. How can we collapse that model and get it straight into the hands of particularly mothers and women? And I would love for you to share the kind of vision behind Beauty Counter, that moment when you were sitting there and you realized that this particular space needed you and you weren't gonna be able to turn your back on it. Thanks, Robin. Um, uh, I think that, you know, the, the, the point in time, well, this whole thing, like, like for everyone else here, we've all had these experiences. Some were born into them. Others um, came along the way. For me, I became very impassioned with the environmental health movement and was really able to make sweeping changes throughout my life in areas like my household cleaning products or switching from plastic to glass or, you know, all the things, there were a lot of things that I could do that um, helped me take control over my exposure to toxic chemicals. But then when I went to look for beauty and personal care uh, and body care products, I was really struggling to find products that met my new standards. I could find 
all the brands from the mass market all the way through the luxury brands that were high performance, aspirational, chic, on trend, sexy, whatever. But they were filled with all these chemicals that I had, no, had knew had been banned or restricted in the EU and, um, and were linked to health issues. And you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, the EU has banned or restricted approximately 1,400 ingredients from many products, many of which you know, go into personal care and cosmetic products, of which we now, at this point in time, have banned 30 in the United States. Um, so we're dangerously far behind the times. Uh, we haven't updated a major federal law regulating cosmetics since 1938. And so our $62 billion cosmetics industry in the US alone is governed by one and a half pages of legislation that allows companies to put whatever they want in the labels and they don't have to disclose. It's similar to what you're talking about. They, they, you don't have to disclose anything in the beauty industry. You can put whatever you want into the products. So when I learned all of that, I became really focused on, to your point, sharing this information. I felt like I had this gift of knowledge and it was my responsibility to share it with everyone that I came in contact with. And I did that and I do that. And my children cringe and die every day when I'm like, excuse me, ma'am, don't spray that sunscreen on your baby. Um, and I do it all the time because I really, I, I feel fortunate that I know this. And so when I was talking, uh, when I was trying to, um, so, so the idea for Beauty Counter really was um, born of, I want high performance products. I want to feel as you know, cute and sexy and you know, whatever, as beautiful as I can. Like all other people in this world, we want to look our best. But I wanted to be safe and the, the options on the safer side for me were not as compelling. They didn't work as well. They weren't packaged in a way that was aspirational. I thought, well, why can't I have both? Why can't I have performance and safety simultaneously? And so we started this company and in trying to figure out how we would sell our products, I knew that we would have an e-commerce component because everyone you know, lives in you know, the digital world is the world today. But I also knew having come from the retail world that um, traditional retail and specifically department store model in my opinion was over and that we weren't going to compete well on the shelf side by side with brands who had no desire for this industry to change and didn't want our story to be told. And a friend of mine said to me, have you considered going direct to consumer through independent consultants, and my immediate reaction was, hell no, like I knew nothing about it. But then I started thinking about how do we power this movement with people and storytelling. And just like we're doing in this room, that's what many of the women and men who sell our products do. We are educators first, so we um, really focus on helping people make informed choices by uh, you know, spreading information that they, um, that they should know about the fact that there are unsafe or um, questionable ingredients in the products that they put on their largest organ every day. Um, and so we talk do a lot on the educational side. We obviously aim to provide solution through product, and Beauty Counter has launched over 100 products since we, um, since we launched in March of 2013. So we've been in the market for four years, although we've worked on this for several years before, uh, before we got out of the gate. And then we spent a considerable amount of our time, and we leveraged this network of independent consultants um, on our advocacy work. We spent a lot of time in Washington. And for those of you who are in our world or know of our brand, you probably have seen us in our campaigns, um, texting members of Congress, um, taking 100 um, delegates to uh, to Washington, D.C. with us last year, meeting with members of Congress and telling them, and we've gotten, you know, as far as the vice president or former vice president to say, this is an important matter and we need more health protective laws so that all Americans have access to safer products. And it's, I think for us, it's been, yes, you can buy our products online. We've done strategic partnerships with Target and J. Crew and Goop, and we've done um, some pop-up shops, which I think will continue to trend on because it's been successful for us to redefine what that beauty experience is. But this is a movement being powered by people, and we feel as women and men, we want to share important information with those that we love. And so it's been an opportunity, we, we've created an opportunity where people can build businesses that are financially rewarding for them, whether they want to work five hours a week or 50, most of them are part-times and many are moms, but they're, they're able to earn an income while simultaneously educating and having significant social impact. And I think that we've, you know, like everyone in this room, we are... There's a moment in time where things are shifting greatly in this country and globally, and I think we are at the forefront of that. And I, I, for me, it was just, it was the white space that I saw. It was where I felt I could leave a lasting impression on this earth and for my children. You know, I think, I don't think a lot of people think about it. And, you know, we're so mindful of the food we put in our bodies. And I think, you know, this decision to go organic with our food tends to be sort of the first step that many people will take. But I remember when I first heard, you know, and especially in the food allergy space, 
parents were contacting and they were saying, you know, the, the, the lotions contain these things that contain peanut oils or other ingredients. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, what is in that bottle of lotion? And you flip that label around and half that stuff you can't pronounce. And as I was learning about it, I thought, okay, skin is your largest organ. It's your largest organ. And if you were to take every pore on your body and put it together, it's the size of your mouth. And so what are you feeding your skin? And would you put it on your heart and your lungs and your liver and your kidney? And all of a sudden, you know, I'm realizing this really matters. This stuff really matters. And I had never thought about it before. And I can remember, I mean, I've, I've known Greg for a long time. And she had members of her team send me this stuff. And I thought, you know, you kind of in the back of your head, you're thinking, is it going to work? You know, if they've had to take all this stuff out, is it gonna work? And I think what's super important is that it's not just what they keep out, but it's what they choose to put in. And I think what they choose to put in then is, are these products and these ingredients that truly are revolutionizing industries. And we see it across all four of these companies that these guys represent. And I think about the longer term impact. I mean, what we're doing now in business is you can do well and do good. And I think as companies are coming forward, companies like Tom's, Zappos, you know, what we're realizing is what is this greater good that you are doing? What is the solution that you are solving? And for entrepreneurs, is your product going to hurt or is it going to heal your consumer? Because the only way you've got a viable business for the long term is if you're healing the consumer. And I think that's a revolutionary shift that we're seeing in business today. Companies like General Mills are acquiring companies like Annie's for $800 million because they see that compass as a way to lead them forward. And I think we're going to continue to see consolidation and acquisition in this space across these categories. And for some people, you know, the, the consumer may cry out, oh, but they're selling out. I don't see it that way anymore at all. I see it as these companies buying in. And the reason that they're buying in isn't just because it's a successful business model. It's because cancer doesn't care where you work. Autism doesn't care what party you're affiliated with. These conditions are hammering all of our families. If we were to go around this room right now today and ask each of you if you know someone with cancer, do you know someone with food allergies or autism, pretty much I'm sure every hand would go up. And that's what we're dealing with. That's the responsibility we have now in business today is to make these better products and not make the perfect of the enemy of the good, but to really lead this forward. And so we're in the early innings of this. And I think Kathy and Kelly, you guys are different because you were sort of born into it. But I do wonder, as we now, as leaders, and I think about Greg, I think about you know what my responsibility to these four kids, as we, as we grow the next generation up, as we mentor the next generation up, I'm wondering if there is something that you can sort of tap into that, you know, what was it in your parents that you saw that that responsibility was passed down to you? Well, I would certainly say in my case with my father, it was the courage of his convictions. So there were certainly a lot of naysayers and people saying that it wasn't necessary or that they didn't believe in the science behind it. And I think that now more than ever, it's really important for people that understand the science to take a stand and especially for businesses to do that because we're at a time in our nation where it's important that green businesses take leadership roles. And so watching my father, I really admired his strength, his courage, and his perseverance. And, you know, obviously long before he had me, I mean, they made a, a film about this, but he grew up in Nazi-occupied World War II Greece and came on a ship and didn't speak the English language and lived in homeless shelters. And, you know, his story is really such a moving and an inspirational story. Um, and growing up as his daughter, I certainly admired that. But now as a mother myself, I really want to teach my daughter to always do the right thing. And sometimes in the short run, it doesn't seem like it pays off, but it really does in the long run. I know for our brand, being authentic, really walking the talk, doing the things that we say we're going to do, right? Carbon neutrality, water neutrality, all the things that we're doing that we believe in, they make sense not just for the environment and for human health, but they make 
good sense for business too. And so I think it's important that we're out there and we're really telling the story of why green is good for business, why it makes financial sense, why putting solar on your rooftop, although it's an upfront investment, pays out in the long run because you're harnessing the limitless power of the sun. And so I think that, you know, as a daughter, I certainly got that from my father. And as a mother, I really want my daughter to grow up really making sure that she practices exactly, you know, what she believes. And she really sticks to that courage of her conviction. I really appreciate that insight. And then, Kathy, I'm thinking of you. Um, the communication model has changed from 100 years ago. And right now, we have tools and resources with social media that we didn't have. And it's changing the game. It's changing the ability to communicate. And something that I've seen in the farming community is their love is for the land and for the soil. And when you tell them that they need to adopt a 21st century model and really communicate, get a Facebook page, do something online, it freaks them out a little bit. And so I'm wondering if you can talk to that transition within the company, within the brand. That's very, um, being the age of transparency, our panel, um, I thought, um, uh, probably a model that are, are an example I might share. Um, we had in about, we've been the organic fertilizer company forever, right, 1925. And I've been through when I was younger where you're, um, you're the yucky, stinky stuff. Oh, get that stuff out in the back of the garden center. We want the pure white powdery substance chemicals. This is how we're gonna grow our garden. And, um, and so that has evolved where now organic is a little more attractive you know, a little more attractive, but we've been through, um, and I saw my grandfather fight through it and my father fight through it, and we've been organic all this time. Well, in 2010, the definition of organic changed. And we said, we, we had been recycling, and I know Ed Begley was a huge fan of, that we've been recycling biosolids for that many years, and no longer could you call your products organic if it had biosolids in it. And we thought, wait a minute, We've been, we're organic since 1925, what are we gonna do? And we uh, looked real hard at who we are and decided, you know what? We are going to be a double certified organic company. We're gonna do all that it takes to get the State of California certification, much more difficult than the OMRI certification on every single product that we carry. And then, you know, see where that lands us, right? Way more expensive, way more complicated, we have a whole building full of people that do nothing but register the labels in now all 50 states, because there's different labels in every state, and then communicating the one message, you know, that organic is better. And um, we had a nice lift in people started recognizing that this was the right thing to do, and then our largest customer, Home Depot, picked us up and said, would you please come to the next area, which was upstate, um, sorry, North Pacific Northwest, such a nice response. They thought the name Kellogg may not translate out of, you know, a 90-year-old marketplace that you've been in forever. Went to Texas, tripled those sales. Went to Florida, tripled those sales. And so there was this um, awareness because I think people are studying labels on the internet. They're, they're checking in with Facebook. They're enjoying a gardening community and an organic gardening community. So, you know, as I listen to you, I think about the responsibility in education that you obviously um, own. And I look to Greg and Beauty Counter, and again, to see how vibrant that community is online, and the constant sharing, the constant joy, the excitement that's in the community to share the products. And I think what's fascinating is, like you, I mean, that, that MLM marketing model, you know, a lot of people sort of retract from with this like, uh, factor. And what you have been able to do is set procedures and protocols in place around your consultants that has them sharing the very best of Beauty Counter. And that doesn't happen accidentally. There obviously is a lot of planning and a lot of thought that went into the education model of your consultants that turned them not only into ambassadors for product and sales, but ambassadors that you could then take to DC to lobby. And I want you to touch a little bit on that because I think it's easy to say, oh, this is a beauty product company. It's very much an education platform and those are two really different pieces and I would love to kind of get your thoughts on how you were able to build up that part of the business. 
Well, I think that, um, first of all, you know, we think of ourselves as a direct-to-consumer brand, like many of the people in this room, right? We don't, when people think of historical, historically, when they look back at what they consider to be direct sales or network marketing companies, I think that they um, really, they created an, an economic opportunity for people, which was really powerful. Uh, what they haven't done historically, and I'm speaking in broad terms because there are those who've done a better job with this than others, they, 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 they did do things that, two things that we didn't really agree with. First and foremost, they only allowed their consumer or their client to shop through the isolation of that channel. And we don't do that. We are a direct retail brand, direct to consumer through multiple channels, the largest of which is our network of independent consultants. And what we found is that people can, uh, they like the opportunity to shop a single brand through multiple channels. And so we allow them to take advantage of that. And it, it, it's changed the perspective for both our clients, but also our consultants who represent us. I think the other thing that, that we felt strongly when I first was learning about this industry, which I knew nothing of, honestly, at all, uh, I went to a conference and I remember them saying, you know, you're your own CEO and it's um, one brand, a million voices. And I said, oh, no, 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 that's not who we are. We're a million voices, one brand. We are going to do this in unison. We build a movement together. We use the same materials. We share the same information. And you are not allowed to go off and do what you do. You're more representative of a movement and you have a responsibility to share information accurately, to be an educator and to do it on par with the rest of the team. Because if you're off you know, going in your direction. And what we, we always use the analogy for our consultants that, you know, when you go to Starbucks, you know you're in a Starbucks. The, the barista can, you know, introduce themselves or say good morning to you in their own way, but you know you're, the coffee's consistent, the experience is consistent, you know where you are. And I think that's how we look at sharing our message and our story. And I think we spend a lot of time ensuring that, and it's not perfection, there are times when it changes, but I think really making sure that the information we share is accurate. One of the things that we've learned through our, you know, constant conversation, you know, some people use social media to gather information about their clients, what people, consumers are, are doing or wanting, and we, we are able to do that, but I think because we are fortunate to have 30,000 consultants who sell our products in the U.S. and Canada, we can ask them, you know, what they're looking for, but we can also, uh, you know, use them to, to, to drive, to drive sales or drive educational moments or whatever we're trying to do. Um, but what we found in, in having these really um, rich conversations with them is that about 75% of the women and men who do sell Beauty Counter entered into it because of the mission. They're there for the mission. They want to be part of, of meaningful change. They care passionately about the issue. And so we find that people are out there, they're, they're talking about it and they're educating because that's a point of pride for them. They don't necessarily need the money. They may, they may not, but it's really for them about you know, what we're all trying to do here, they're trying to change the world and they're trying to make the world better and safer for their communities. And so it's easy for, it's not easy, but it's with a concerted effort, it's, it allows us the opportunity to keep the messaging consistent and educational. Yeah, and if you think about just this week, it was announced, I mean, again, we are disrupting industries, we are disrupting models. And just this last week, Sears announced they were gonna be closing their stores in Kmart, you know? And if you think back 50 years, I mean, those were, absolute staple names across America, and they're about to disappear. And in the age of Amazon, in the age of Thrive Market, in the age of Beauty Counter, we're not only revolutionizing the product, but we're revolutionizing the distribution model, which in my opinion has to be disrupted because that's where so much of the extra costs get stacked into it, which makes it unaffordable and unattainable. And I know the goal of this panel, I know the goal of every single person who is part of this movement is, how do you make it more affordable and accessible to everybody? Because until it's a solution for everybody, it's not really a solution. And I think the challenge we have in front of us is, we know now, how to choose better. We know what the products are. 50% of Americans on any given day are purchasing organic products. The thing that most people don't realize, and it's a challenge for companies like this, is that less than 1% of our farmland here in the United States is organic agriculture. We have 912 million acres of land that we manage in farming. 4.4 million of that 912 is organic. And if you were to you know, go around the room, I mean, Kashi did a study where they asked people what percent of, of farmland do you think is organic? Most people guessed about 20%. We're at less than 1%. And so the challenge for companies doing the right thing is that supply chain. It's a bottleneck. And you see this time and time again where a company like Applegate has to pull their non-GMO livestock feed from countries like Australia. You see another challenge in a company like Applegate where the founder did not have 
a daughter or a family member step into it. And he was forced into the sale of his company to a multinational like Hormel. And I think, again, to recognize the pioneering leadership on this panel and to really come together as an industry and say, how do we tackle these problems? How do we make this more affordable, more accessible? And I think ultimately, you know, we're gonna have a big rethink on the way that we farm in this country. And I think, you know, we're gonna see leadership coming out of companies like today's panel. You see companies like Patagonia really stepping into this issue. And to me, it's a really exciting time. It is ripe for new leadership. There are so many people that have been part of this movement for a generation, and what we're seeing is this next generation come into it. Hayden touched on it briefly with you know, their ability to really reach millennials, and I think I, you know, I have three teenagers in the house and a little caboose, and I see these kids, what they do online with their apps and with their technology, and it's how do you tap that? You know, how do you make that information available and accessible and empower them. And I think, you know, it's very easy to dismiss the millennials, but I love working with them. I love the passion. I love the hunger they have to drive the world forward. And I'm wondering, in your work and in your experience, what you see next, you know, coming out of this generation? Yeah, I mean, I think social media is such like a, you know, it's all you kind of hear about these days. What are you doing on your social platforms? And, you know, for us, and, and Greg kind of mentioned it, it's, it's, how do we use these platforms to support our mission? And how do we make our conversation really relatable to all people? Because if our mission's this accessibility or this high nutrition, making it a realistic, realistic being the key word, how do we support that in all of our channels? And, and really, it's kind of just to have fun. Um, I think that sometimes it's, you know, we overthink it or what's the strategy for every platform and how do you grow and, or, or how do you grow and, you know, we've really just done it organically. Um, you know, I, I constantly think back when we were four days old, uh, literally, Prest was four days old, we were selling juice out of our kiosk, and a lady came uh, who at the time was, was the head buyer for, for uh, Whole Foods and said, we want to put you in all of our stores. And I was like, <laughs> holy shit, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, but we kind of, you know, we decided at the time to not pursue it. And the reason was, um, not always, but you know, when a bottle sits on a shelf in a grocery channel uh, and then all these bottles essentially look the same and you have three seconds to capture someone's attention, how, how do you tell your story? And I don't want to say always, but often um, some of these brands don't and they don't do a great job of really differentiating ourselves. And for me and my partners, because Prest was started out of such a passion, we wanted to share our experience and our story we said, let's just, let's just open our own retail stores. And what that does is it forces us to have the one-on-one the -on -one conversation with every person who walks through our doors. Um, and we look at social media as really an extension of that. It's, it's our voice, it's our ability to communicate with our customers or directly. Um, and again, to just continue to have fun with it. Yeah, I think a lot of people sort of initially dismissed social media or there were definitely CEOs that thought they were above social media. Some of the most effective CEOs, like Annie CEO John Foraker, he was right there in the middle of it, you know, and he talks about when they were acquired by General Mills, I say, you know, that was the day the internet threw up. They had 30,000 comments flood their Facebook page in five days with people freaking out. And rather than try to be above it all, he got right down in the middle with it and he learned so much about where his consumer was, how her heart was hurting, what she was going through, and he was able to address it and move through it quickly, you know? And I think these are really powerful tools that we have, not only to connect with the consumer, but to drive some pretty massive change. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, this, the topic's about transparency, and you know, often on social media uh, platforms, you watch, you watch a question, often a controversial one, come up from a customer and it get deleted and you know quickly by the by the company we use that as, as an opportunity to really answer it to be loud and you know look you can't be everything to everyone and and we fully acknowledge that um, we, we've kind of focused more at pressed on on nutrition and health um, but we allow that to kind of use these platforms to kind of answer and explain why we've made the decisions that we've made and that kind of resonates you know it's uh, you build the trust you build that transparency and you know, if there's, if there's certain people that, that, for whatever reason, don't like our answer, we can accept that maybe we're not the right fit for them, 
But there's, you know, there's uh, fortunately tons of people who feel that we are the right fit. I add something to that? I just want to say that I think it also creates an amazing opportunity for smaller businesses and middle-sized businesses to compete against the corporate giants because social media really democratizes advertising. You know, we compete against brands that have a hundred million dollar advertising budget for one SKU. And we certainly can't spend those types of funds. But the millennial consumer cares more about what their peer said online than any sort of big budget ad that they see. And so TV ads and these other things are far less effective now. So really being engaged in social media and Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter and you know Instagram is so useful for smaller and mid-sized brands because we can really, really increase the velocity of our products off shelf by having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yeah, I think you know the word that's resonating right now is authenticity. You know, we live in a world where we put out these perfect pictures and selfies and things like that, and when there is an authentic story that comes through, it is crystal clear that's exactly what it is. That authenticity you cannot fake. And then the other piece that you cannot fake is the passion. And I think, you know, for a long time we talked about people, the planet, profits, but I think the fourth P in there is passion and how business is now giving permission to that. A great example, um, on Black Friday, Patagonia decided they were going to launch an initiative where 100% of their profits were going to go towards these environmental organizations to support them. With them yesterday, the CEO said that when they launched that, that they expected to hopefully hit two million in sales that day. She said she called Yvonne at three o'clock and she's like, oh my God, we're at, we're at six, you know? And then she, he said, and then she called me at dinner and she said, we hit 10 million. And again, what they had tapped into was that magic of the people and the passion and the purpose, you know? And if you, if you speak with Yvonne, you know, his product is the soil. That's what he cares about. You know, we're kind of the people over here, we're this byproduct, and what he cares about is the soil. And I think, you know, as you build out these teams, you have the person that cares about the product. You have the person that cares about the profit. You have the person that manages the people. And in all of that, you, if you underlie all of that with passion, you have this incredible magic that can happen, as we've seen in these companies. Um, I know Kelly will be on a breakout session later today at one o'clock, if you want to ask questions there. Um, is there anything else, you know, as you guys, I think probably one last question I'd like to ask each of you is, let's flash forward 50 years from now. We've reconvened this, you know, and we're sitting here. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, I know in our case, I mean, I, I'm really committed to having a socially responsible business as well. And so we've taken a big stand on paying a fair minimum wage. So we pay 17 an hour at our facilities. And when I look, you know, 50 years from now, I'd certainly love to see that our business has grown dramatically. Uh, we have the four centers now. I'd love to see that we would have facilities in Europe and Asia and that we would be, you know, reducing our carbon footprint further because because we'd be manufacturing locally there too. But I'd love to see you know, a world that really understands the great importance of protecting our environment and our planet. And I really think that the movement underfoot now, I've seen this year so many more people galvanized and energized around it. And so I'm very optimistic for what our world will be in 50 years. But I certainly hope that our business is being run by uh, the fourth generation uh, at that time. <laughs> that would be nice too, uh, fourth generation. Uh, my daughter will be here tonight, so everybody say hello to her and encourage her. This is very cool. Um, 50 years from now, I, I'm just going to answer it in maybe one word and elaborate, is life. And we believe that organic builds life. That's a hashtag um, in soil. And as I told you, my Friday night fun was seeing how soil is alive. We, then we purchased two, well, in one month, three little tiny companies came to us and said, take our baby, please. And one of them is a beneficial insect company. And I learned so much that, you know, we are using so many, that's why I brought my little props, gallons and gallons and gallons of pesticides, home consumers are. And um, they don't really know, their neighbors are, your neighbors are. And this other little company we bought has a sesame oil, you know, that kills bugs. It's really effective. It's, uh, it's uh, 
carrying ingredient is gold standard vitamin oil, right? Fish oil. And it sits on a shelf, picture this, at, a, at every single retailer, Walmart, Home Depot, you know, Lowe's, one little tiny quart like this. So I asked, hey, what's great? You know, how much, what's a good amount of volume? And um, I was told the buyer said, hey, you sell one of those a month? That's really good for that environmental stuff, right? So I looked at the salesman for the neurotoxin that had bottles this big and 12 in a row. I said, what's the volume of this? And he said, I'd be fired if I didn't sell 100 a week in every single retail location. So 400 of these compared to one sesame oil, right? to kill all the insects. And, and this isn't well marketed, it's a terrible name and it's got to do a whole revamp on the um, package. But my hope is that 50 years, we're gonna have sesame oil and fish oil for controlling insect infestations and even better, we're gonna release the critter that will kill that bug, eat that bug and not eat your plants. So that we have life in the soil, we have life above the soil, and that's, that's my vision. It's a very hopeful one. We restore the soil, we restore ourselves. Well said. At Beauty Counter, we're really focused on getting safe products into the hands of everyone. And that's, that doesn't mean those are Beauty Counter products. I think we just want people to have access to safe products. And to that end, I think what our long-term goal is, is not only to make the world healthier and safer and better for people, but to... In, in this country and beyond our borders as we, as we begin to expand is to make sure that the legislation that governs the beauty, personal care, cosmetics industry is health protective and that has sufficient regulation to, um, to, make, to ensure that uh, ingredients that are going in and on our bodies are safe for human health. And I think our other, you know, real goal to that end is not only to let to have legislation or further legislation over the industry, but also the entire worldwide supply chain. It is very difficult to manufacture and to know that even, you know, that, that things are safe, even though they say that they're certified organic or whatever it is, that there's, there's a lot of ambiguity in the worldwide supply chain. And I know many, many companies struggle with this. And so I hope that in time, we'll see more health protective laws governing the industry. We'll see further regulation over the global supply chain and that the world will be healthier. I have no doubt that you will do that. For those of you that don't know, the cosmetic law has not been updated since the 1930s. Wow. You think about how much this industry has evolved with absolutely no regulation around it. And Greg, your work is so important, so thank you for making that such a huge part of the mission of the company. Hayden, for you, I feel like you have a serial entrepreneur in you, you know, where you're struck by these ideas just in everyday life, and I, I really am excited to kind of see it, that continue. Um, what do you hope your legacy will be? Yeah, um, I mean, I feel, re I get really excited and passionate about getting products like what Prest puts out and all of us um, for everyone, that everyone has the ability to access them. You know, this idea that like health and wellness is not a luxury, it's a right. Um, and you know, and you've gotta, I know I say this a lot, but you gotta have fun. Um, you know, people always say, you know, is, is juicing a fad? I'm like, are fruits and vegetables going away? Because, you know, I've been told my, my entire life to consume just that. Um, but for me, it's, you know, we, we started Pressed With Juice and we've become something so much bigger because we continue to push the envelope and we be, continue to have fun. I'm, I'm super proud of what the team at Pressed has accomplished, but I feel that it's, it's just, we've barely scratched the surface of what's to come. You know, juice is incredible. As I mentioned earlier, we didn't invent it. Uh, but you look at products like Freeze, which we created about a year ago. We, we invented a soft serve made from produce. Uh, no chemicals, no sugars, nothing other than produce. Um, and we've launched, we'll have about 25 of them up in about a month. Um, that, to me, is so exciting. You know, we've taken, you know, coffee, which is everyone consumes coffee. Um, and we've created a, uh, our version of it, which is adding superfoods to it. You know, um, you know I, I, I've had the opportunity to meet with some of the big boys, you know, the Cokes and the Pepsis of the world. And, you know, they've made comments to me about, well, it's the coast that, green, that drink greens juice. I want to change that, you know. And, and for me, I think the way you change it is through education. 
And education is no longer a textbook. Education is trial. Education is showing people that healthy food can taste great and it can be fun and you can make an ice cream out of kale. And I know that if I can make that taste good, which, you know, I, I think we have, um, you get people to try that, it opens their eyes and their minds to trying so many different things and incorporating, you know, it starts with, with one area and then it just becomes, and like we talked about earlier, it's that ripple effect. You know, you start, you share, and, and before you know it, everyone's kind of... Well, and I think it. what's so contagious is once you feel better, that starts to radiate from the inside out. And then you have people asking, God, what do you do? Like you did with Chris, like how do you have this energy level that you have and maintain this every single day? And I think what's so exciting to me is it is so accessible and the solutions are right here in front of us. I think, you know, as administrations change, we are gonna have different leaders that are policy aware and we're gonna have different leaders that are much more open to driving change in the marketplace. For the next few years, we are in a market-driven change, and I think the leadership that can come out of business right now is extraordinary. I think we're going to have to demonstrate that you can do better and you can do well, and that as we start to demonstrate this extraordinary success in the marketplace, policy will follow the money. Policy always follows the money, and I think you know the leadership that you guys have taken is amazing. We will continue to see different challenges. I think the supply chain issue is a very serious one. And when someone suddenly throws out the idea that we're going to tax imports that are coming into our country, the grocery store stocks were hammered the day that news hit. They all dropped because what people don't realize is the produce section is where a lot of the revenue is driven in a grocery store. So every single day there are new challenges but in that, there are also these new opportunities. And we really have to step back and think, you know, if we had a whiteboard, what would we design? What do we want the future of food to look like? What do we want the future of cosmetics and body care to look like? What do we want the future of farming to look like? And what do we want the future to look like for our families? What is so exciting is that is in our hands right now today in this community with everybody that's here assembled today, we have an incredible network of investors and entrepreneurs in wisdom. So I really invite you to grab these guys as we wrap up here, ask your questions, and thank you again so much for being part of this today. Thanks.